I have been a recruiter for, for 25 years in the association sector. This is something that is near and dear to my heart and is actually something that I have been talking about for a long time. But now finally, I have a real reason to do it in a formal setting like this. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I will start by saying that um, I live on both sides of the hiring aisle because I'm not just a recruiter, I'm a career coach. And I wanna mention that to you because I have a very strong empathy for what job seekers are going through these days, what they are looking for, what they're seeking, what, why they take jobs, why they don't take jobs, the frustrations that they have in the market. And I want to mention this to you because I have a real feet on the ground, right? Boots on the ground kind of a perspective here. So what you're hearing um, is a very sort of a 360 degree perspective on why you are having such challenges in this market. So here's, how, here's where we're going to start. This is the question that's confounding everybody, right? Here we go. If there are so many great candidates on the market, why can't I seem to find the good ones? And the reason, of course, you're looking for the unicorns. And my statement for that is they're found in fairy tales, not in resumes. We have been talking about this for a long time, we in the recruiting world, whether you call them unicorns, whether you call them purple squirrels, you know this in HR. What happens? The hiring manager comes to you and says, what? I need you to find me this impossible to find person, somebody who has 12 out of 10 skills. I did not just misspeak. 12 out of 10 skills. The person who walks on water carries five lakes behind them. We are always, always pulling our hair out. Whether you're a full-time recruiter like me or an HR generalist like some of you on this call, I know how difficult this is. And really there's one solution, only one. You need to expand your candidate pool by expanding have you and your hiring managers think about hiring. What I want to talk to you today about is this big disconnect. There is a disconnect. There always has been, but I would suggest to you right now that in the midst of the great resignation, the reason why we have the, that, this, that this disconnect is so profound is because people are rethinking work. They're rethinking their lives. Now, this is the, I'm sure if, if any of you are old or not, as old as I am, this is, this is my fourth recession. Probably for a lot of you, it is as well. Maybe your third, but this is my fourth recession. And on the one hand, this recession or this coming out of the great recession um, is no different than any other, other one in the sense that, you know, during a recession, what do people do? They hunker down, they hold on for dear life on their job, right? And then all the economy opens up and people start leaving. On the one hand, that's the same. On the other hand, it's not. Because the very big difference here is that people have been home. And when they've been home, two things have been happening. Number one, they realize, wait a second. This remote working thing that I've always been begging my employer for is suddenly a reality. It's no longer just a perk. It's something that I can actually demand because people see how productive I've been, number one. And number two, I've recognized what work-life balance actually means, what it means to not have a two plus hour commute. PJ knows what I'm talking about coming from where she comes from <laughs> on the other side of the earth, right? Not having that commute. Now, the flip side of that, of course, we all know this because we've all been working from home for two years now, right? Is you can't turn off. And when you can't turn off, there's the big, the B word, burnout. So on the one hand, be careful what you wish for, you just might get it. So people are conflicted. They want the remote, a lot of them do, but they also are, don't want to be burned out or stressed at. What's the worker to do? What's an HR person to do? So here's the big disconnect. And I want to break this down into two, two, two concepts. Here's what most employers want. Most of you on this call would probably nod your heads vociferously when I go through this list. What do you want in the hiring process? You want to mitigate your risk. I could stop right here. You want to mitigate your risk. You don't want a risky hire. And how do you prevent that? Well, first of all, for a lot of you, and I know you're, I, I recognize you don't always have control over this. A lot of your organizations want people to come back hybrid. Yes, some of you have, are, have decided to go fully remote. That's great. But for those of you who haven't, you at least want the idea of, well, we're still a remote for now, but hopefully sometime in the near future, we want you to be able to come back hybrid. You want people who are going to drive results, who are going to advance your mission. You want people at the right stage of their career, not too junior, not too senior. Now, we all know about age discrimination. We all know we're not supposed to do it. But I will tell you, back, um, gosh, a few years ago, not even a few now, it's been more than that, I was doing a Della Sherm presentation. I was testing out my little hypothesis. And I said to a group of folks just like you, there are 50 people in the room, and I said, how many of you regularly hire people over the age of 50? for non-executive roles. Two people raise their hand. This is just the way that it is, or at least it has been. Now, I believe there are some people that are more open now than they have been because, because of DEI issues, 
age diversity is, is something that we all need to be thinking about. But generally speaking, most employers hire professional positions between the ages of 25 and 45. That's just kind of the way that it's been. And that's why I started BoomerWorks because I wanted to help the 50 plus community to re-career into self-employment because a lot of times we're thinking about right stage of career. You want someone who's going to understand your industry, understand your customer base, your client base, your member base, right? Someone who has the right background for the role. You want someone who has a minimal learning curve. That's part of the hiring risk, right? Someone who's not going to come in and take time away from your hiring managers. These are the things that we're always thinking about. You want personality, you want culture fit, and certainly you want the lowest possible salary, okay? But contrasted to that, what do most job seekers want? The flip opposite. They want to love their work. This is not about your mission right now. It's about their mission. They want to feel valued. They want to enjoy their life. They want a job that they're not just capable of doing. They want a job they want to do. They want work-life balance. They want the flexibility. They want the remote work, right? And I want to stop right here and mention to you that I did, a, um, I did my first LinkedIn poll. I don't know. You know this has become a big thing right now, LinkedIn polling. So I did one about a month or so ago. And uh, the question that I asked was, how important is remote work to your job search? I got 309 responses. 41% 41, 41 of them said, very, it's non-negotiable. Non-negotiable, I will not accept a job unless it's 100% remote. 48% of them said, I prefer remote, but I'm okay with hybrid. And only 11% said, I actually want some time in the office. So 89% of them are saying they want remote. Now this is peanut gallery stuff. This is 309 responses, but this is what the, this is what the stats are showing. And you can even look for yourself. For organizations that you are, where you guys are insisting on going back hybrid, do you want to go back to work? <laughs> look at your own selves, your own lives. This has become the cry, right, of, 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 of job seekers. They're looking for this kind of this, this remote situation, at least for most of them. They want competitive pay that respects their experience. Look, if you have ever followed Robert Reich, the former DOL labor secretary under Clinton, you will know he says this all the time. Wages have been flat and falling in this country for the last 30 to 40 years. What happens? Somebody leaves their job. And what do we do? We go back to the, 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 the prior salary. Oftentimes we do that. We don't necessarily start right with where the person left. We're always trying to lower costs. I get it. We're all trying to be fiscally prudent. This is what we're all told to do by our CFOs, right? Get the lowest possible salary. That does not cut it anymore. We need to be much more competitive with our pay structures. You're hearing it all over the country where people are suddenly saying, uh-oh, you know, we, we, we're, we, we're, we've got competition that we never had. And for those of you who happen to be in the technology sector, I don't know if there's anybody on this call because I know a lot of nonprofits here, but especially in the tech sector, you've got Amazon here paying people hand over fist to get to, to, for, for tech roles. And if you're, if you're hiring an IT person in your, in, your, in your nonprofit organization, you're competing with Amazon. You're competing with all the other tech companies now and people are just paying, paying, paying. So I just wanna be, make you sensitize you here to the competitiveness of, of pay. You, the organization, the, the job seekers want a financially stable organization. I know you can't guarantee it, no guarantees in the world, but they're looking for it. They don't wanna be job searching anytime soon. They want a great boss and coworkers. Do you know how many people are leaving right now because of toxic work cultures? We could just have, we could stop right there. <laughs> We'd stop right there. How many people call me for career coaching or for executive coaching and are saying, I gotta get out of, I gotta get out of here. My boss, my coworkers, the culture, it's not fitting me, right? Too much negativity, too much stress. People have been saying this for a long time, but right now, even more so because of the pressure cooker that most people feel like they're under. So they want a great boss. They want great coworkers. They want career advancement. They want to grow professionally. Now, look, I'm sharing these things with you. None of this is news to you, not really, but I'm trying to put contextualize it in such a way that you see the contrast between where you're coming from as, as hiring managers and recruiters and HR people and where the job seekers are coming from. These are the things that we need to start looking at one by one by one. This is not new. And yet what has happened over all of these years, we sort of let it go to the wayside. Well, I don't necessarily need to be as competitive. They should be happy to work for us. We always felt like we were in the driver's seat and now it's a seller's market and people are much more demanding. Positive reviews on Glassdoor. I had a situation very recently. Um, I, I run a, a, a free job seeker group uh, for, uh, for, for job seekers. It's an open Q&A every Friday morning. It's called Higher Moment Mastermind. And one person this past Friday actually uh, was saying he actually has two offers. Okay, this is not uncommon right now, right? People are getting multiple offers. He has two offers and he goes, well, he goes, the one that I just accepted, he had actually accepted the job. He goes, I went on Glassdoor, 
reviews were all negative and oh, I don't know. And he called somebody that he knew there and she backed that up. She's like, yeah, really demanding executives, all this stuff. And he came to us and he goes, basically, do I back out of the offer? Do I back it? What do I do? Now, had the HR person addressed this with him in the interview process, had the HR person gone to Glassdoor, seen what the reviews were like and said, you know what, look, I just want to let you know when, you, when you're looking out there, you might see some da 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 I'd like to address that with you. I'd like to share with you a little bit more about our culture, right? Maybe you can also, not even just on the interviews, actually use that as part of almost like an employee engagement survey, but on the, on the flip side, people who've left the organization or even people who are there are writing these things on Glassdoor. You can use this as part of employee engagement to build your culture up, address the problems that people are talking about in public. This is affecting your employer brand, whether you know it or not. We can no longer continue to put our heads in the sand and think that people aren't saying things because they're saying things. And we, it's our job to address them. And of course, they want a culture where they feel like they belong. And you know, in the DEI world, we talk about the B for belonging, okay? And that's, that's, that's not a light thing. People want to feel like this is family, this is home, this is a place that they can actually settle into and have professional development and feel like they've got great coworkers, right? They're, they want that warm culture now. This is, this is not a place, right? Not, not a day and an age where people want to be pushed to the limit. Even though we have the pressures, we, we continue to put it on them. So in the interview process, these are some of the things that need to be addressed. Okay, so let's bridge the gap. Here, here we go. Number one, are you willing to expand your search requirements? Are you willing to stop looking for the unicorn? Number one, must those candidates live within a commutable distance? We could stop right here and have a big old conversation. Do you know how many employers I talk to all the time about this? I, just this, this last week, I think I've talked to like two or three and I'm constantly consulting with them. Do, do they really need to come into the office? What? And, and, you, and you look at this, right? And you say, oh, all right, well, look, the CEO thinks we're gonna go hybrid, but we're not quite sure, but maybe for this position. And I don't, it is not an easy answer. I get it. I've got to pose it to you. The search I'm about to, probably gonna be, gonna be taking uh, very soon. This is an organization that said, look, we're remote right now. The, the employer, the, the CEO said they wanna go hybrid. Okay, fine. But the CEO is also insisting that people um, you know, have, they have to be able to come in. Well, why? Well, one of the jobs is government relations. Okay, they need to be on the Hill. So I said, okay, fine. So instead of insisting that everybody be in the office, because that's what they were going to put on the job announcement, I said, look, at least you can say, fine, they need to be in the, in the DMV area because there's certain positions that need to be remote. But not all of them, not all of them. Can you expand your requirements to get a larger pool of candidates? This is, I pose this to you because this is one of the most serious questions you're going to be facing in this market because job seekers are doing what? When they look on Indeed, when they looked on LinkedIn, when they look on the job boards, one of the first things that most of them look for is remote. Is this a fully remote role? Is this a fully remote role? And if they don't see it, a huge percentage of them are just backing away. Literally, you can't even talk to them. They won't even apply to your job. That's how much of a pivot we've had in these last two years. Number two, can you flex on your must-haves and your nice-to-haves now? A lot of times when we put these search announcements together, and I'm talking to my colleagues here, right? You all do what I do. We all do this exact same thing here. When we're putting these, these search announcements together. What are we saying? Well, they have to have this, and they have to have that, and they have to have the 33rd thing. Do they, do they really? Do they really? Do they, which skills do they really have to have to do this work? Do they, can there be any learning curve here? Can they get other resources from other individuals? Can they, do they have to literally slide into home base with no learning curve. And you're saying, well, but they're gonna to have to learn about our, our organization and I, I get that. But you know how many career changers there are there? Do you know how many people who have fantastic skills who have 70% of what you want, don't have the other 30% but we're checking them out the door? Including myself, we all have, we all have these, 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 these artificial requirements. The experience level, the experience that they come from, the background that they come from, the industry experience. We're all, what do we all say? We all do this, we all do this this many years of this and these particular skills and you have to come from our industry and all this stuff. And look, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a medical society. And so you have to come from another medical society. You can't just come from a trade association. You have to come from medical society. I mean, we do this. We all do it. Can we flex? Education. How many of us are still insisting that every one of our jobs requires a bachelor's degree? 
We all say that we want DEI, and yet we are inadvertently cutting off economically disadvantaged populations. We just are. I'm not saying you can necessarily get around this, but I wanna just encourage you all to rethink, do we absolutely need to have the bachelor's degree for all of our jobs? Can we expand our DEI lens and say, you know what, there are people who may not have been able to afford to go to college. They might have gotten part, part way through college and maybe they, their life changed and they weren't able to go back, but they're qualified, they're wonderful people, they're talented people. Do we have to continue to insist on this? Are you open to career changers? All right, there are so many people in COVID right now who've done the soul COVID soul search. They're like, I don't wanna do this industry anymore. I don't wanna do this career anymore. I wanna completely shift. How hard is it for people to do that? Super hard. It always has been. Again, because it all goes back to that first slide. We all wanna mitigate our risk. And so it's very difficult for us to, re to consider somebody who hasn't been there, hasn't done that, doesn't have the five t-shirts. Are we open to exploring and saying, you know what, if somebody, into, if somebody applied to this job and they really meant to apply, not the ones who are just checking boxes because of, of unemployment insurance, I don't mean that, but they really are interested in this. Have we ever taken the time to like talk to them and say, I don't see it, but Susie, can, can you help me out here? What was it about this, about this job that really appealed to you? What is it about our mission that appealed to you? You might have a diamond in the rough. You might have somebody who's so hungry and so eager to work for your organization and do this job, Maybe they've got the right attitude and maybe their skills just need a little bit of developing. Now, is this a panacea? No. Is this an easy thing? No. Have, are, you, are you all going to say to me, oh, we've tried that and that didn't work? Yeah, I get it. It's not a perfect situation. And yet this is another way that we can stop the unicorning, right? And start to expand to get a bigger pool of candidates. Downshifters, those who have a certain age, right? Who say, look, I don't need to be VP anymore. I'm okay with director. I'm really fine with that. Hey, I want a mentor hey, I wanna get into a situation where I don't have to have that, that intense stress situ stressful situation. I'm totally fine with downshifting. What about return to workforce people? The moms, right? For example, not always moms, but I'm just gonna use that as one demographic who, who had to stay home, right? For a period of time. How flexible are we to recruit them? Do we go after, right? Do we go after recruit to diverse recruiting pools? And we know some of them, because we're, again, we're all, we're all more, more or less well-versed in, in DEI right now, we, we are looking certainly to expand our racial demographic, ethnic demographic, gender orientation. Again, are we looking at age? Are we looking at vets? Are we looking at people with disabilities? Both physical and neurodiverse. I put a, I put a, um, a link here, just one little article that helps you to, to frame up your job, your, your search announcements and your interviewing for, for people on the autism spectrum. All kinds of areas of diversity that we tend not to even focus on, right? Unless prompted. So this is, a, this is something that you can consider. And then are you looking at non-traditional recruiting sources? How many of us do the perfunctory post on Indie, Career Builder, LinkedIn, job board, blah, 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 okay? Are you looking at listservs? When I say listservs, I'm not talking about the, um, about the DC, I, I, PJ didn't mention it, but I'm the, the founder of the, the DCHR Brown Bag. So for those of you who are on that list, I don't mean that. Yeah, post your HR jobs there, we do that. But are you going to other people's listservs? You're looking for a marketing professional. Are you going to the DC chapter of the American Marketing Association? Are you going, you're looking for an accountant. Are you going to the, to the DC chapter of American Institute of CPAs? That kind of thing. Looking to other association colleagues who, 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 who's, whose members, right, are in that area. Are you recruiting passive job seekers? We all know that the only people who apply to the job boards are active job seekers. They're wonderful people, nothing wrong with them, but we are missing out on the passive job secret market by using LinkedIn's advanced search. And I get it. Most of you are HR generalists. You don't have the time, for, like someone like me as a recruiter, to go in and do all the wonderful searching that you need to. But even if you can't afford to work with, with an outside recruiter like me, I really want to encourage you to start taking the time, making the time to learn how to leverage the advanced search features because these are gainfully employed people who could be perfect for your, for your fit. And they're just waiting for you to call them, right? You're, they're waiting for that outreach. They're not active. They're not going on the job boards. They're just minding their job. And one day, oh, I got to get out of Dodge, right? The culture is not right for me, what have you. And you can, you contact them on the right time of day, right? Internal hires. How many of us are really looking internally for wonderful, talented people? Or are we just saying, you know what? You're great at your job. We're just going to keep you there. We're going to go outside for this hire. There could be somebody who's, 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 who, who, who absolutely wants to grow. Maybe they don't just want to grow vertically. Maybe they want to grow horizontally. Maybe they want to do some cross-functional projects. They, they have an interest in something, right? And they've never even expressed it to you. But maybe this is the time to ask. 
and you say, you know, I know you're in the accounting department. We've got this thing in marketing. You're like, wait, what? Accounting? Who knows? Maybe they've been studying graphic design on the side. I have no idea. But you won't know either unless you ask people. Are you really trying to tap your internal folks for career development? Are you looking at previous candidates? Are you looking at previous employees? Now, some of you have ATS systems that actually track some of that stuff. Some of you don't. So maybe you're too small. Do you have any mechanism to look at people who otherwise were fantastic? Maybe they were, they were the number two or number three candidate. Somebody who left the organization, maybe they're not happy where they are. Are we proactively reaching out to these other non-traditional recruiting sources? And return to the workforce, as I mentioned, okay? Are you going to mom's, group, mom's groups? You know, things like that. Are you going on Facebook? Are you figuring out who are the people who are re need to return to the workforce? And they cannot get, they can't wedge themselves in because they don't have the box checky kinds of things that we keep asking for, but maybe they're looking and maybe there are other pools that you can be expanding yourself to. Okay, so let me shift gears here. I wanna help you create an employee-centric hiring process. This is one of the ways that you become their first pick. So here you go. First of all, I want you to create a high touch candidate experience. Now, some of you already have this and some of you might have some, some opportunities to, to grow in here. This is what candidates are thinking, seeking. They want a user-friendly experience. How easy is it for them to apply? If it takes them more than 10 minutes to fill out an application, a lot of them will bounce, right? Is your hiring process well-defined upfront? When you get on the first call with that candidate, are you explaining to them step by step managing their expectations. This is exactly what's going to happen. We've got this level, then that round, and these people, and here's the timing, and we just want it. Do you know how many candidates, in fact, almost every single call that I do with the, on my Friday morning higher moment mastermind call, um, we, have, we have somebody on this call right now who, could, who, who probably is probably nodding her head when I say this. How many people say to me every single week, Shira, I don't know. I haven't heard back from the recruiter. I haven't. Do I follow up? I don't want to be too nudgy. What's the right process? Blah, blah, blah. What's the product? And I'm constantly having to navigate this. Why? Because very, very busy HR professionals like yourself, and I know you're going Mach 5 with your hair on fire. I get it. I get it. But even in your busyness, you can still define the process and manage expectations, especially those active job seekers, guys. They're literally waiting by the phone. Literally, not the passive ones necessarily, the active ones. Let's flip the script and remember you're busy, but they're nervous. They want this job. They're literally waiting for you to call them. But if you manage their expectations and say, look, it's going to take three weeks or four weeks, or blah, 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 blah. if you don't hear from me here by this time, you're welcome to reach out. <sighs> now, all of a sudden, they've just taken a breath, okay? And you're being very employee centric, you're being candidate centric. How responsive are you when they do reach out? Are you just letting that email go? Oh, I'm just too busy. I can't, I, can't, I can't be bothered. Or do you have some sort of mechanism? Even if it's not you, maybe it's somebody in your department. Just a quick outreach, say, touch base. Say, oh, thanks candidate for, for reaching back out. No news yet, happy to reach. It just settles them down, right? And, and also helps to create a better relationship with you. Remember, you're courting them now, even if they're an active job seeker. They have a decision to make, just like the candidate I mentioned to you from last week. He saw those glass door reviews and he's, he's thinking of literally pulling back from his offer. You need to court them as much as they are courting you. So what are you doing here to make sure that you're responsive, that you're timely in your responses, that you're proactive, that you're empathetic to their situation? All of this helps with your employment brand. All of this smooths your onboarding, right? Making sure they know what the onboarding procedure is going to be like, not orientation. We know there's a difference, right? Onboarding. Who are they going to meet with? What's the timing of that? managing their expectation. You want brand ambassadors, not only somebody who's going to want to work with you, but someone who's going to go out there into the community and champion you and say, oh, you got to work for ACC. Oh, you got to work for endocrine. You got to work for, right? You want those raving brand ambassadors. And part of it is how this candidate experiences you in the recruiting process. The next thing is make sure the job aligns with their career motivators, not just their skills. Again, I could, spend the, I could spend the whole rest of the time just talking about this one. This is one of my passion areas. And so much so that I created an, organ, an, an exercise called passiontivity, okay? And this is an, an exercise that I use in three different ways. I use it in my recruiting, which is what we're gonna talk about right now. I use it as in my career coaching to help people figure out their, uh, their career, career, directory, career direction. And also you, can, you all can use this as an employee engagement tool on a regular basis to teach your hiring, manage, hiring managers how to take their team 
through this exercise. And here's how it looks. So it's four quadrants, high motivation, low motivation, high skill, and low skill. This is an exercise that aligns a, candidate's, a candidate or an employee's skills with their career motivators. And the premise is that just because somebody, somebody is capable of doing something doesn't necessarily mean they want to. But where somebody is both capable and highly motivated, they're highly engaged. In fact, this is the concept of first quadrant, high engagement. When you are recruiting somebody, your job is not only to check the skill boxes. It's not my job to just check the skill. Can you, can you, have you, have you? Will you, will you? The other question you need to ask is, do you want to? And I'm gonna give you a quick example of that. Years ago, I was doing a search for a director of publications for a medical, medical association. And it was a situation where the board and the, 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 uh, the, the journal committee said that they wanted this director to only do the production of this journal, not touch any of the content, no editing, no writing, no I dot, no T cross. Don't touch the content. That's our job because we're the SMEs, right? We're, this, we're the subject matter experts. Fine. So my job was to find someone who was capable and wanted to do that. And I remember being on the call, I think her name was Jennifer. And I looked at this resume, I was like, oh, this, I was salivating. I'm like, oh my gosh, she's got everything. She's perfect. Get on this call. And I take her through a, a quick version of this exercise where I asked her about the things that she wanted to, that she's capable of doing and she wants to do versus the things that she doesn't want to do, stop gap work. And turns out that she, oh, she loves doing production work, but she also loves writing and editing. She loved the content development. And I talked to her and about 10 minutes into the conversation, I kept probing and probing and probing and probing. And finally I said, Jennifer, what I'm hearing you say is you are only gonna be fulfilled if you have a job that's basically 50% production and 50% writing and editing. And she goes, mm-hmm. And I said, it's been wonderful to meet you. I just don't think this is the right opportunity. Do you know how much time everybody was saved? She was saved, the hiring manager. Can you imagine her going through the entire process, which was, has happened to all of us, I'm sure, she goes the, if she'd go to the whole process, she's doing her little candidate, best candidate self and saying, oh, I can do this and I can do that. And even convincing herself. And then either she backs out before, right before the offer, after the offer, or three months later, she realizes what the job really is. And then she leaves because we didn't take the time to actually ask her what she wants to do. And then you've got professional development. What are the areas of professional development that the candidates want to do and need to? The areas that they would enjoy growing into and the, can, and the areas where eh, they have a bit of a weakness, right? So let's say it's a marketing professional that they want to grow into social media strategy. Maybe they've got some of it, but they want to be better. That's a learning curve for them. That's okay. People want to grow, right? They want to be challenged. It's okay that they don't know everything 100%, but they have a learning curve. But maybe they're not so great at managing budgets because they're not really a, a numbers person. Good for you to know that. Good for them to know that. And look, if the job was 50% budget management, may not be the right job. I get it not only because of the, for them, for, for not just for you, but for them too. If they realize, oh, I'm going to have to do 50% budget management, that's not my job, okay? Let them make the decision too by asking them what they want to do. And then finally, low skill, low motivation, this disengagement. Find out upfront, what are the areas that drain these candidates? And if 50% of the job is something that drains them, again, it's not good for you and it's not good for them. Okay, so this is my, my encouragement to you. And by the way, I will give this uh, PowerPoint to, to PJ, so you're welcome to, to have it. Okay, so here are some other tips for you in terms of expanding your pool, or not expanding your pool, about, um, uh, about creating an employee-centric hiring process. Discuss this work-life balance and flexibility early on in the conversation. Don't wait. Normally, we know pre-COVID, pre we didn't care. I mean, we talked about it a little bit, whatever. Hours and this, now it's such a big deal. Address it up front, address it in the job announcement, address it in the interview, make sure you understand what they want, what their expectations are. Maybe they're open to a little hybrid. They want two days, you wanted them to do three days. Negotiate this. The last thing you want is to go all the way through the end of the process and you lose somebody. Why? Because, oh, I decided I only want the two days and you want me to come in three days. Things like this have been happening, okay? So I'm, I'm, all these little tiny things matter. Discuss it up front. Help them really understand the role the expectations, the roadblocks. And I get it. Look, in HR, we only know what we know based upon what the hiring managers are telling us about the role. I get it. Some of us get have, 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 have more uh, engaged hiring managers and some less. Some, some, but to the extent that you can partner with this candidate and say, look, this is really what you're getting into. 
These are our expectations. This is the scope of the role. Here's some challenge. Get into it with them. Give them a full, clear understanding. The more you do that, the less likely it is you're going to have a turn down. The more likely it is you're going to have somebody who's highly enthusiastic and is running after the role, presuming it's something they want to do. Address the culture. Address the supervisor relationships. Address the coworker dynamics. Don't hide it under the rug. And I know no place is perfect. I know. You're like, uh uh-oh, that hiring manager, oh, he's a toughie. I get it. But you know what? There are some personalities that might be able to deal with that person better than others. Address it up. Don't hide from it. The candidates are listening for these things, right? Prep them before the interview. It's okay. You can be like me. I'm a prepper, right? Because that's what we recruiters do in third parties. You can do that too. You you talk to the candidate and say, look, you're about to meet with with supervisor so-and-so. We share with you a little bit about their personality, their style, their needs. Let me address this. You're going to have a friend for life. I mean, they, they they won't know what to do with themselves. They'll be so indebted to you that you've actually helped them to understand how to navigate and manage the, the, the supervisor relationship and coworkers as well, because you're looking for fit, so are they. Again, proactively address your culture and the glass door reviews. Don't let those things hide under the rug. You just, just, just don't do it. Allow them to meet the full team if they want to. I get it. We all have our hiring process. We meet with HR, you meet with a hiring manager, maybe meet the CEO, maybe meet with a team member or two. If they are asking for more and they want to meet do your very best, be as inclusive as possible. You might even want to proactively do that so that everybody's feeling bought into the process from the candidates all the way to the coworkers so that they feel like they're, they're being welcomed and they're being onboarded well. Provide a safe space to address all of their questions, even the sticky ones. A lot of candidates feel that they literally cannot address their questions. They've got some ones and they, because most of them feel like they're not in the driver's seat. And for the most part, they aren't, right? I wish this was an equal relationship, but oftentimes we know who's in control here, or at least we feel like we are. Now they're turning the tables, but a lot of, especially the active seekers are like, well, I don't know, uh, should I? And they're wringing their hands. They're asking people like me, what do I do? Create the safe space. Allow them to ask anything. It's okay. Their needs are just as important as yours. And I know you know that up here. I know every single one of you would totally agree with me, but do we prove it in our processes? Do we act that way or do we just think that way? Create the safe space. Discuss their interest in your mission. And for especially for those of you who are in the nonprofit sector, which a lot of you are, that's a big deal for people. Most of the candidates that I talk to are very mission driven, very. And by the way, do you know how many corporate people are actually looking to switch into the nonprofit world? Oh my good night. Constantly, constantly like, oh, I can't stand all this profit centric thing. I wanna do mission. Are we open to those folks? And again, are we discussing the, the mission? Because once, once we do, a lot of times they get actually pretty excited about working for a mission like yours. Talking proactively about career advancement and professional development is not a light thing. A lot of folks, especially folks that are earlier in their career, are hungry for this. Are you not just saying, I got to mission reimbursement? You get, no, 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 no. This is how we proactively groom. I know, PJ, for example, you're very much into this in your organization. You are very, very proactive. You know, I have to imagine that you talk about that in your interviews. Like this is something that you need to go after. They need to understand the value to them in their career, not just their value to your organization. Be transparent about comp. Now, this is another one we could sit on for a while, okay? Now, I know I don't have to talk to you guys about pay equity. You're in HR, you know about all of this. I think it's, I know it's at least 27 states in the union have it. I don't know if any, what the latest stats are, but anyway, we know about pay equity. We know that we are no longer, at least in those states, I think we should all take the high road on this, Um, how we are no longer, of course, allowed to ask about salary history. We all know that piece. But there's some best practices in going to be more proactive. Are we still asking candidates about their salary expectations? Now, it's not illegal to do that, but you know there's still disparity there. When you ask somebody who's from a marginalized background what their salary expectations are, what are they going to tell you? Something that's relative to to the salary that they used to get, which still creates the pay gap. So your job, and I, and I know this is tricky, and I work with my employers all the time when I'm recruiting about, about this, is are you listing a salary? Notice I did not say a range. I did not say a range. When you list a range, what do people expect? The top number. They don't get the top number, they feel low ball. This is a psychology here. If you come up with one number, a number that is competitive, that is realistic, not breaks your budget, but not nah, doesn't come, but it's not too low volley either. A really, so- yep, we can do 130. We, we can solidly do 130 for this job. 
I feel like the market's going to be competitive. And you actually list that on this description. It manages everybody's expectations. Candidates will be like, thank you for letting me know. And you don't have to be stuck with that number either, because if you have a little bit of wiggle room right above it, you can still negotiate at the end. It's okay. But you still start out with something competitive. Talk about comp. And by the way, talk about raises, not just your COLA increases, but maybe, you, maybe you're able to do to start giving more raises. Maybe, maybe it's not just once a year. That's kind of a, there's a, a, a new practice out there where some people are doing incremental raises throughout the year, just so people feel like they've got a little more, a little more, a little more, and they don't have to wait until the end to get that two to 4%. Address that up front. Offer creative and family-friendly benefit options. Now, there's a lot of things you can do. I just came up with a, a quick laundry list that I was doing some research. First of all, this sounds so simple, and I don't know how many of you do this. Go beyond just your, 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 your 401k match. Go back to a contribution. It's okay, right? Just say, I'm going to give you money. You don't actually have to match it. I'm going to give you money. It doesn't have to be a defined benefit exactly, but something where you're contributing no matter what. Reducing medical premiums. We know how expensive they are. Okay, and with and with the low the low salaries that people are getting and, and and health premiums going through the roof, I get it. You're suffering too, but so are they. In fact, you might even be individually suffering with them. Add some gym club memberships. Do things that are more creative for their health and wellness. Paid caregiver relief. Remote work options with a home office budget. Ooh, what a concept. Child care assistance, pet assistance. I mean, you guys could get creative with this, but the point is, is that all these kinds of little things, right? help to show that you're more of a family friendly kind of a place. You're looking out for your, your employees. You're not just looking for your, bot out for your bottom line. Assuring them about the organizational stability to whatever extent possible. And the bottom line of everything here, address their needs, not only your business goals. Because really, really the bottom line, and, this, and, I, and, I, and, I, I, and I make no apology in how I'm phrasing this, showing candidates that they are appreciated as a human being, not only as a human resource, not only as a human resource, I know our terminology. And again, notice I'm using a lot of we here. It's not about, this is not my finger pointing. This is us. We are all in this community. I have been in the HR community for over 25 years. I've been on the Sherm, I, I, I get it. I understand this. But the terminology that we often use does not value people as much as we need to. We say human resource. We say human capital. We say talent acquisition. We say people are our greatest assets. I'm standing on a soapbox. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'm speaking to my my colleagues with love and respect. Candidates feel this, employees feel this when we say these things. I'm not saying that we can suddenly change everything to chief people officer. It'd be lovely if we all could, I get it. But it's more the mindset that we have. It's not even just the language that we use. Are we really respecting and valuing our people respecting these candidates because they do feel it from us? And that's my job. I preach this, I preach this all the time. I preach it to myself. <laughs> what can I do as a recruiter and as a coach? And as somebody is part of this HR community to create this kind of experience, okay? That is why I bring this to you. What can you do to shift your mindset and your policies, your procedures to create a much more employee-centric culture and a recruiting process? So here's our discussion, okay? We got 20 minutes left and I'm gonna have uh, PJ break you guys out um, just for about, about seven minutes. Can you do that, PJ? Seven minute discussion. I'm gonna put three questions up here, okay? The first one is, what are the non-negotiables your, your organization insists upon for every search? You got some, we all have them. Your CEO said, oh, for the gots to stuff. Number two, what would it take to influence your leadership to turn those non-negotiables into nice to haves? Hmm, think about that, okay? There might be things you're just like, but Cheryl, my CEO insists, I get it. They all do that. What can you do to be a neck that turns the head? And then finally, how can you create a more high touch candidate experience that makes you an employer of choice? Is there anything that I mentioned today that just sparks an idea? Like, oh, you know, we could do this. We could change this. Even if your process is great right now, can you go from good to great or great to greater? <laughs> okay. So I would encourage you to take a screenshot of this so that when you get into your breakouts, you'll have what to, what to talk about. Okay. So uh, PJ is going to put you into rooms about three or four, maybe five in a room. Um, seven minutes, <laughs> uh, come back, come back here. And then actually in your groups, we're not going to go room by room. We wouldn't even have time for that anyway, but just thinking as you're talking is this, did somebody mention something that was a particularly good idea? Trying to get at, not just thinking, thinking, not do well, my problem is I want this to be a solutions focused conversation. What's possible? What can you do? And can you, can you spur each other on and encourage your, each other to do something that's just a little bit better? to create a, a, better, a better candidate experience, okay? So PJ, go ahead and put folks in the room and then we'll see you back in seven minutes.
Hey everyone, I hope that, hope that was a good, a good engaged conversation. I was able to bounce into two rooms. Um, so in our remaining nine or so minutes, and I'm happy to stay a little bit longer if those of you want to, those of you want to stick along, stay around with me. And, and PJ says she's got a few extra minutes as well. Um, so let's go ahead and, and tackle questions one and two together, and then three. So I'm not going to go room by room by any stretch. I just want to, you know, kind of hear from you guys. Can you raise your hand and just say, hey, you know, here was something interesting that we discussed, the non-negotiable, and then maybe how you you or maybe your colleague would influence your leadership to, to overcome it a little bit. So who'd like to start? Uh, Phil, Phil, Felipe, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Oh, yeah, it's Felipe, yes. Um, yeah, we had a good conversation. You know, there were some that were in certain sectors like government that you know, they couldn't, there were some non-negotiables that they couldn't just change because it was that or maybe because they were uh, under a, um, a collective bargaining agreement and that prevented them from being able really to negotiate when you're in that situation. Um, but then outside of that, talking about looking at changing things, like I shared that when I first got to my job, everything was required. Two years required, this required, changing the requirement to preferred. That's simple okay. right there. Yeah. The world difference gives you so much flexibility. And I shared how we hired somebody that had only seven months experience that originally the job required two years experience. And if we kept that as a requirement, we never would have hired this great hire. So that's, those are one of the things that came out of that conversation there. By the way, not for nothing, we talked a little bit about age. You know, there's a lot of discrimination on the other end too. How many of us insist on not being the guinea pig employer? You know what I'm talking about, right? We want the one to two years, three years of experience. And there could be some great recent grads who, by the way, may have great internships, which actually is work experience. You know what I mean? So they, they might have a lot more experience than you think and are hungry, ready to go. And they just, you know, so to the question to, to Felipe's point, does that entry level role have to have the two to three years? Can you actually look at the recent grad? Because I'm telling you, this is a, a generation that is struggling to get work. I think you all know you might even have children who are in that who are in that that situation, right? Where they just cannot break in to a very crowded market. So thank you for that, Felipe. All right, anyone else on this question one or two? Non-negotiables or how you're going to influence leadership. Can I add one thing about leadership real quick? Please. So one thing that we talked about with leadership, you know, obviously, I think most of us here probably are naturally inquisitive and, and stay on top of trends and read articles and, and try to stay informed, right? We can't assume that our leadership team all does the same thing. So mm -hmm. I, I realize that, you know, seeing them articles, whether it's a LinkedIn article, whether it's brief little articles that talks about something or an uh, NBC article. I did one that was a um, 60 minutes live article talking specifically about this topic. And I just sent them the 11 minute snippet of it. That was so much more powerful in influencing them and educating them on what's going on and the struggles and challenges to help them open their minds to think, hey, think differently. Think about grooming somebody from inside. Think about taking someone young and, and teaching them our way and, and having them grow and succeed and be grateful for us to us and us be grateful that we got somebody that Absolutely. really works well. So just wanted to share that. You know, there's that expression, the prophets never accepted in their, own, in their own hometown. How many times have you tried to influence leadership and you've said the same thing a hundred times and you bring in a consultant and they say that, and you're like, really? And then, right, the, <laughs> you could use this for a new recording if you want, use this PowerPoint, whatever you need to do, just have an outsider say the thing that you've been trying to say. It makes a lot of sense. Thanks for leaving. All right. Um, any other any other thoughts? The, the remote thing. Like, can we just talk about that for a minute? I know this is such a big, a, ugh, it's such a topic, right? With hybrid. Um, how many of you? How many of you have organizations that are in, where your employer or your senior leadership team is insisting on hybrid? Yes. Insisting. <laughs> raise just physically raise your hand. Yeah, it looks like about about half of you or so. Okay. Um, yeah, this is this is this is something that just has to be dealt with. Uh, we can't we can't avoid it. How many of you have had any success talking to your leadership about flexing more than they want to on this topic? Um, all right, Samantha, I'm just going to call on you randomly. I think there's a bunch of people who raise their hand. Can you share with us really quickly how you did it? What 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 would you take them from what to what? It's so it's been specific. It's position specific, right? So we've gone, we've actually flip flopped multiple times about whether or not we're going to allow people to be remote outside of the DC area. Mm -hmm. But my argument is why can't we allow people inside the DC area to be hundred percent remote? Got it. That's right. And I Do get work. we have this beautiful office space to use, but 
look, your, your, the, your leadership's need for using their real estate and mm-hmm. creating quote unquote, a better culture does not outweigh your candidate's need for work life balance, period. And it's the, the company culture that everybody keeps going back yes. to. Oh, we're going to, how, how much productivity have we gotten over the last two years? How much teamwork has, has gone on? How many slack rooms and team rooms and that, that, that we've done it. Is it perfect? No. Is it wonderful to have people huddled around a table? Of course it is. But on balance, right? Again, your needs, their needs. We cannot afford to constantly tip the scales toward our side. We just can't do it anymore. We've got to be listening to people and they're just not taking it anymore. I'm sorry. It's like the song, right? <laughs> just mm-hmm. not. And they're not coming to your door because you're sitting, because you're going like this. Well, this is what we want. Fine. Then you're not going to get me. That's <laughs> just what they're saying. And can we afford to continually narrow and shrink our pool of wonderfully talented people? Cause we have an insistence on something that frankly may or may not even be a reality. Right. And I know we know this. I'm preaching to the choir. I get it. I get it. But I just want you to know that you're not alone. There are people like me and like you that are out here and we're all kind of beating the same drums. And to Felipe's point, to the extent that you can bring in outside influencers to your leadership, maybe it'll help them 5% in the conversation, just something. Bring yourselves together, get colleagues together. Hey, do a LinkedIn poll like I did. Why not? Why in the world not? feel free to go do it. It's like, it's the common thing right now. In fact, actually I did, I did, I, um, right before this call, I, uh, I was, I was checking out somebody's LinkedIn profile. You know how that, you know, you have the thread, the very first thing on the thread, I snipped it for you. I just, I just pasted it into a word doc and it said this, which of these perks, these perks would most sway you in terms of accepting a new offer? 71% flexibility work from home. Now this is just the comp, the ones that he made, but right over and over and over and over again. Remote, remote, flexibility, remote, flexibility. All right, Uh, I'm looking at the time. And for those of you who can stay on, I'm happy to stand for a little while longer. I just want to uh, tackle number three. How can you create a better, um, a more candidate-centric hiring experience? Now, with this one, the the second room that I I bounced into, uh, they were, I think it was Cindy, I'm so sorry, Sway, I can't remember exactly who else. Um, we're talking about the, the length of your hiring process. I didn't even deal with that in the presentation. How long does it take to move your candidates through the process, oh, right? We could be losing people artificially just because of our normal process, let alone vacations and all the other things. Um, Cindy, did you want, do you want to raise your, could you, could you pop in here? Because uh, you were, I think you were talking, were you the one who was talking about your process and how you're trying to shorten it? Yeah, um, talking with our supervisors to try to maybe have more interview panels versus individual interviews, trying to make sure that when they start the process that they already have a plan to finish it in two to three weeks, you know, so they're not, um, they're not extending it any longer than they have to extend it. And I think um, Sway was also in this breakout room and, and um because even though HR can follow up with emails and phone calls and letting the candidate know, hey, we're still interested, this is the next step, things like that, um, the best thing we can do is just shorten the process. Mm-hmm. Exactly, that's great. Anyone else talk, want to talk about that or anything else around your process that you want to make um, or you even you have made, I believe we can talk best practices, that you have made a more candidate-centric um, process? Well, I guess I have one question in terms of kind of following up with shortening the process. I mean, that's something we're trying to do as well, but it's, we found that there's this tension between being able to shorten the process and actually developing a qualified candidate pool where you have more than one, you know, one person to present to managers within a a short period of time. So I feel like kind of struggling to find that balance. So I don't know if anybody has tips or things on that. I'd be interested. I have one thing that helped me <clears throat> shorten it. And actually what I do is uh, we use teams, you know, at our company. And so when I schedule an interview, I use teams with the candidates and I send them the link. And what I do is I actually invite the manager to the interview as well. And I let them know, I will ring you in if the interview goes really well. If it doesn't go well, I'm not going to waste your time, but if it goes well, I'm going to make sure the candidate has time. First of all, and if they do, I want you to meet him right away. And again, this is somebody who I feel really strongly about. It's not one of those, oh, it's a maybe. If it's that good, I don't want to lose them. And I want to shorten that process as quick as possible. And there have been, I'd say, four out of 10 times, 
I made hires that same day or the following day after the hiring manager made that interview. Um, and that really has helped us capture some of those really strong candidates that we want and not have them wait too long or get stolen by somebody else. So that's remember, just my- Felipe, I'm so glad you brought that up. Do you guys remember pre-pandemic what people used to do? You used to actually do that. I know you all did. You would meet with it, right? You're shaking your head. You would meet with somebody. You would tell the hiring manager, I'm about to meet again. Stick around just in case. And, and then right at the end of the interview, you say, candidate, guess what? Super, supervisor so-and-so is, would love to meet with you. And you bring them on in. The reason why we don't do that now because of scheduling. You schedule a Zoom call, right? Everything's all scheduled. There is no popping into anybody's office anymore. So Felipe, I think that's a fabulous idea having them on standby that you can just turn the, turn the dial like that. And it's funny you say that when I can't do it on standby and I have to do schedule one, say I schedule it with the manager and the candidate the next day, I still join the call for like one minute to introduce them. Because again, that's something that we should do. We didn't yes. choose the candidate for the hiring manager. So it's a simple little warm oh, handoff nice. and it makes it easier for the candidate to know and the manager's not awkward like, oh, hi, I'm so-and-so, you're, you know. So it's just a little introduction, so. That's beautiful. It's, a, it's the equivalent of pre-pandemic. We walked, we, we met somebody at the door. That's how I try to think about it. down the hall. Good for you. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Any other best practices like that that you guys have done just to, you know, make that employee experience just a little warmer, a little friendlier, create that brand ambassador, anything you guys have done? In terms of interviewing, I found uh, the employee centric mode that you were talking about earlier helpful when not only am I talking to the candidate and finding out about them, but when I'm introducing them to a supervisor or potential colleague or teammate, I let the candidate know something about the person they're going to be talking to, not the role they're in, but something more about them, yes. whether they play tennis or how long they've been with the firm or how we came uh, to know them or something that can connect the candidate to the supervisor or their colleague. So right away, they feel like there is a human being connection mm -hmm. and not just an intimidation factor that they're meeting someone that has their fate in their hands. The human touch, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Doing a little, little prep work like that. It makes it just relaxes the candidate, you know, it shows them that they can, they're talking to another human being. And the fact that you even cared to tell them, this is something about you. This is something about the organization. All these little things add up in the mind of the candidate. Is this a place that's going to treat me with respect and dignity? Do they care about me as a person, not just valuing my productivity? I mean, do you see the theme here? And I know we're doing this and we're all doing it in varying degrees, but can we do it even better? Can we spur each other on, right? And create just a little bit better. This is great. So um, I know we're at 403 here. I just wanted to see if there's any, any, other, any other folks that wanna chime in with, um, with some, any, any comments around any of the topics that we just talked about, any best practices, anything you'd like to share? I know I've spoken a lot. I swear this is the last thing I'll share. I promise, I swear. But I just, I think this is, a, giving people visuals has always been very powerful and it's been very beneficial to me. And when I'm doing an interview and I get to the point where I'm showcasing things about the company, I always tell people, if you want a visual about the things I'm talking about, visit our YouTube page or my LinkedIn page, because there we showcase employees. We showcase our innovation. We, we showcase the fun that we're having as a group, you know, and it kind of tells a story and it validates what I'm saying. I'm not just blowing smoke up, you know, you know what, I'm actually being real. And if you don't believe me, go check it out yourself. yourself. And those visuals, really a lot of times they'll pull it up. I can tell they're pulling up during the interview and all of a sudden you start saying, oh, oh, I see your mobile truck. That's really cool. Or I see your, how you all, the employees do signal chefs and share their own recipes. And that adds the culture. It shows that how we do things together. So any chance to show a visual like that, it doesn't have to be LinkedIn and, and YouTube. You can do Facebook, Instagram, whatever you want, but those are the two that I use. Felipe, what you're talking about is actually employment branding. Exactly. Are yeah. you using your website to showcase your culture? Do you have a career page, not just a career page that lists out your jobs? Are you talking about your culture, the environment, how, having pictures of your own staff and what they like to do together? Felipe, that's exactly what you guys should be doing. And it, not only on your website, but in the job descriptions them, themselves. Are you talking about the culture? Somewhere along the lines. Motley Fool, by the way, does a fantastic, I mean, it sounds like Felipe does too. Right? But Motley Fool has always been best in class with this. Fabulous place to work. They open up their doors. They show people what they do. Their job descriptions are fun and creative. I'm not saying you have to be like them exactly, but I do want to encourage you to do something else that makes the entire experience from your website to the job descriptions to your interviews that shows the candidates this is someplace they want 
to work, okay? So with that, I'm gonna wrap things up here. I'm gonna actually share with you uh, my contact information in case you guys wanna keep in touch. All right, feel free to take a screenshot of this. Like I said, I will, I will send, a, send this PowerPoint to, TJ, to PJ as well. And uh, it was wonderful seeing all of you. Thank you for your enthusiasm and, and time spent here. And you know, just keep it going, pass the love on, right? This is what we're all here to do is inspire and encourage each other to create better cultures and, 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 and bring on, have a, have, a, have a much great, better culture, okay? All right, so good to see you guys. Have a blessed day. PJ, anything you'd want to say to wrap up? Just thank you so much, Shira. I think this was so very helpful and we'll just continue sharing through the round table as different things come up. It's an area I know all of us are struggling in, but thank you so much for all of the great uh, information and helpful hints today. We certainly do appreciate it. You're very welcome. You're welcome, guys. All right, hope to see you around the HR community. <laughs> Bye everybody, have a great day. Bye-bye.